Uh, my name is Rob Pilot. I'm a senior sales engineer at Intrepid. And um, my product is uh, the RAD IO2. I'm the product manager for it, as well as the industrial value can. And uh, first of all, I'm going to go through what are the deliverables when you buy the uh, RAD IO2. Um, and uh, just kind of quickly go through that and then say, like, what is it? You know? Well, first of all, um, it is physical measurement. And uh, when you get the rad out too, you get this nifty box, the case that it comes in, this cool box, the cable that hooks up to the PC, and the jumper cable in case you want to attach more than one rad out two to each other, and some blocking plates um, such that if you want to attach more than one together, they attach together firmly. And you also get all the connectors on the front. So there's other slides of that right there. There's the box, the nifty case, and the different accessories. <clears throat> and the jumper as well. So you can see how if you were to attach uh, an analog output to an analog input, you can chain them, chain them together with the case. And these Phoenix connectors, and I'll give you the part number, of course, are included. If you lose them, um, you can buy them from us, or you can buy them from uh, Mauser, DigiKey, or whoever, whatever other electronics uh, places are out that you deal with. And of course, as I didn't quite mention, there's a dovetail on the bottom, a female dovetail, and one on the top. I know that's how you slide the units together. And again, I'm showing the attachment plate, um, the tools to attach them together. So if you were to, to be doing this uh, using the, uh, two units uh, on a rough uh, test track, you would want to do this uh, so that they're securely in place. And here's the product line overview. <clears throat> Starts off with a thermocouple module. There's a relay module. And there's an analog output module. Um, there's an analog input module, and last but not least, the digital I.O. module. And the, uh, the, the sixth item is what we call a CAN hub, and uh, more on that later. But that will convert the native signal that comes out of the RAD I.O. to CAN, uh, to CAN messages. So how do you connect the RAD I.O. to? <clears throat> well, um, you can connect it directly to the PC. Uh, when you connect it to the PC, you use the uh, initially you would use the G, the free JavaScript program to configure the units, and uh, actually you can configure the YARB ID addresses for them too. They'll all default to a factory standard, uh, starting at uh, 29 bit extended, uh, starting at 110 um, packs, uh, going up to the uh, 1 150. And incidentally, the CAN hub is at 100 hacks, 29 bit extended. And you can change those. So once you have your DVC file created with the JavaScript program, um, now you can connect these directly to uh, Red 2, the Fire 3, which will be coming out, um, the Fire 2, or the Industrial Value Can, which I have the demo downstairs. Okay. Uh, the other way to connect the Red IO2 products is by using the CAN Hub. Um, you can connect the output can. The native uh, communication between the modules is a UART. Uh, in the presence of a USB, it'll all also talk USB, and that's the graphic above. But um, if you want to be able to, to uh, read all the different data as CAN messages, you need a CAN hub. And uh, with that, you can, can use any CAN tool that you have. <clears throat> You're not limited to the Intrepid hardware. So again, you can connect it up directly to Intrepid hardware or you can connect it to a CAN hub. Um, you configure it with the uh, JavaScript program. You can also write your own software. Um, we have that uh, uh, used for, you know, right at, uh, right, uh, <clears throat> we have Python and uh, C examples and whatnot on our Git, uh, GitHub site. So the module info is, first of all, the thermocouple module. Uh, eight channels of isolated thermocouple. It's K-type only. 
Each bank has its own, we call them banks. So there's eight banks. And in this case, <clears throat> there's only one channel per bank, okay? So all the Red Idol pro uh, products feature what's called bank-to-bank -bank isolation, um, which means that no matter what you do to the other channel, you will not impact the measurement. Uh, so if you were to in inadvertently hook up 110 volts to the input of the thermocouple on channel one, on channel two, um, you'll re still be reading your thermocouple. You will not smoke anything, you will not fry anything. Each channel is isolated to 2.5 kilovolts, okay? Um, and again, this is K-type only. Now, usually a lot of people have mixed uh, results with thermocouples. A lot of thermocouple modules do not have a separate CJC and they do not have a separate uh, uh, analog converter per channel. The Rad IO2 does, it has a separate CJC per channel <clears throat> and a separate A to D per channel. Um, we do not sell the thermocouples, um, but uh, there's plenty of places that do. Um, the analog input module actually uses a similar, the same chipset as the thermocouple. We just don't uh, use it in thermocouple mode. And uh, there's two ranges to the analog input. Uh, and again, there's eight banks in each bank has, has uh, two inputs, but you can only use one of them at a time. There's the low range, which is uh, basically one volt to five volt plus or minus. I'm sorry, 250 millivolts to uh, five volts plus or minus. And the upper uh, range for the analog input is uh, uh, up to 40, uh, 10 volts to 45 volts plus or minus. Now, what's different about, <clears throat> uh, again, by, by having utilizing isolation, you, we do not have the problem that a lot of uh, analog conversion cards have where that you get what's called common mode. Um, if you were to buy like a six, $700 national instruments card or from somebody and, and you tried hooking up uh, and measuring the top cell of a battery that say, uh, you know, we'll just say it's at like 60 volts and you're trying to just measure 1.5 volts, you'll smoke the board, you'll smoke the card. Because the even though the minus even though it's the minus terminal on the analog um, input, it's still way above the common mode, which is typically ten volts for most analog cards. We don't have that problem with this with this because we use galvanic isolation as a special set of chips uh, that isolate it. So it's really kind of like eight independent float, uh, floating you know multimeters that all report back to the PC. Um, there is the only limitation on this product is we are basically maximum, and then this goes the same for all the Rad IO2 product line, 100 samples a second, so 10 milliseconds. Um, now, so if you're doing vehicle dynamics and microphones, this is not the product for you because you're going to want higher frequencies. However, most of the Intrepid customers are here because of CAN bus, and with CAN bus, you really don't get much faster than 10 milliseconds per can frame anyway. So we're kind of in that in that same way. Um, there will be a, a, an upgrade to this, uh, which would be substantially more money, but um, it will be doing in the megahertz range. But as of now, we're, we're uh, 100 uh, samples per second per channel with an aggregate um, of, uh, of like 2,000, well, basically, basically 1,000 samples per second aggregate in, in effect to just keep it on the safe side. Um, we use a Delta Sigma uh, analog converter. It's actually really more like more or less a 24 bit that is, uh, that is uh, averaged down to 16 bit. So we don't get a lot of jitter. It's a very accurate measurement. <clears throat> and again, we talked a little bit about um, the analog input like all Rad IO2 products provides the galvanic isolation between the banks. And why is this such a big deal? Well, you can do high side shunt um, with our products. You can't do that with a lot of different products. Uh, we do have competitors that, are, that offer um, galvanic isolation. They're usually typically three to five times the cost of ours. So each grab I own two modules, $765 each. So we're under $100 a channel, which is a really good price point um, for this type of product. Um, next would be the analog output. 
Um, the RAD IO2 analog output has eight banks, and each bank has three um, analog outputs. Um, so basically, you've got 24 analog outputs. Now, the reason why, again, the banks are isolated. So if you were at the potential voltage on, say, channel eight, if your ground is way above um, channel one, then you would not want to use uh, the channel one bank one to connect to the ground of the channel of the bank eight. So you just got to keep this idea of bank to bank isolation. Um, and the grounds are all separate that way. So I'll show you in a slide here how you can generate more than five volts. So it's a zero to five volt. Now, say you wanted to generate 20 volts, right? Well, you're going to burn some channels up. But all you basically have to do is connect the, uh, the minus, the ground from the one to the plus on the other, and so on and so on. So basically what that would mean is uh, one module, analog output module, could generate uh, zero to 40 volts. Um, so this could be really useful. You could actually use a stack of these to generate and simulate um, battery cells for electric vehicles. So uh, that's kind of a big, kind of a big use. I have, I've done some things where I've, I've generated like uh, over 100 volts and uh, no issues. And on the same token, if you wanted to generate minus five volts to five, five volts, you would burn two channels out. So that's the kind of the beauty of, uh, of, of the bank to bank isolation. You know, think of it as a, as a actual, like a battery, you know, um, and you can tap off and short, you know, connect, you know, to ground at any point. And it does not affect things whatsoever. Now, the most complex module that we have um, actually is the, the digital input output module. And um, I have a the display down, down in the lobby. If you saw the webcam that was moving around, um, the RAD IO, uh, the DIO module has eight banks again. Um, the first four banks are inputs. And there's three inputs per bank in the ground. So there's four pins, right? So I have an example downstairs where I'm, I'm feeding a function generator signal um, to, uh, to one of the pins, and I'm measuring frequency. And then on the other pin, I actually have a little jumper, uh, and I'm measuring uh, PWM with that. And, and with vSpy, I'm, I'm programmatically controlling the function, function generator too to do sine waves, square waves, ramp waves, things like that. Um, but the, the key thing about this is that you can also, just by sending a CAN message, you could actually measure on the same pin. You could, you could, uh, you could sequence between measuring frequency, period, duty cycle, uh, analog voltage, and so on. All with that one pin, just by sending a different CAN message. Um, so that's very useful, obviously. Uh, because you could, you know, on the fly, you could you could measure different things with that. So you've got virtually like you know twenty, uh, well it would be three three times four, 12 inputs that could be measuring anything, PWM, digital, whatever. And the beauty of it is that there's a programmable threshold for that. So say you've got a signal one day that's zero to twelve volts. So you can set your threshold to five volts. So anything above five volts is going to be give you a one, or if it's a PWM signal, anything above any square wave that's above five volts is going to be considered out. And um, then you know maybe the next day your signal's twenty volts. Well, no problem. You don't need a resistor divider network or amplifier or anything like that. You just set your threshold to whatever 10, 12, 14 volts. So anything above that voltage now would be considered an on. So you've got programmable thresholds, okay? So you've got programmable pins with programmable thresholds. And that would be the, uh, uh, the input, again, of the, the first four channels of the, of the DIO. So any questions there? It's kind of a unique feature that uh, I haven't seen. I've been, I've been making test stands. Um, I've been with Intrepid about four, I guess I probably should start with that. I've been with Intrepid about uh, four, a little over four years. Prior to that, I had a, a company where I made test equipment um, that I owned for 16 years, and we did probably made hundreds and hundreds of test stands a year, um, doing anything from testing engine controllers, doing PV durability tests on engine controllers to 
mechatronic things, the hot oil, hot oil test stands. I had one, one test stand, I had a Parker 250 kilowatt generator held back and, uh, and uh, just to test it because it was through so much current, you know, um, 440 volts at kind of 400 amps. Um, but so we got into some big stuff, but to all the, all the things the same, what kills you, especially on the bigger machines, is isolation. The ground, the grounding just will really destroy you, especially in any high power noisy environments. And that's what the RAD IO2 does, is it gets rid of all those problems. Now for the output, <clears throat> if you notice there's a, uh, a webcam on that display that's moving the camera around. Um, I'm controlling that one uh, basically as two half bridges. There's two little servo motors on there that are working in like a, uh, in a basically in a PWM mode, like a, a spy mode. And I'm just sending it at different pulse widths to go to different positions, okay? Um, and then you may have noticed there was an actuator. Uh, I have it turned off sometimes because it buzzes, it makes a lot of noise, people don't like it. And um, it has, uh, so basically on the, the DIO, there's four banks. You can configure the banks as either half bridges or full bridges, okay? The webcam one is configured as half bridge. The actuator is configured as a full bridge. So basically when you, when you uh, energize it for forward, it takes the current, takes the path here, and here's the motor right here of the actuator. Obviously for reverse, it goes this way. If you're in the brake mode, it actually shorts these FETs out just right here. And, and basically what you've got is that you've got both sides of the motor that are connected to ground, which is called dynamic braking, which will stop a motor like that. If you were to open the FETs up, the motor's gonna coast, okay? And you'll get what's called counter EMF, all kinds of you know, you know, some noise and stuff like that. So whenever you wanna stop a motor on the spot, you short out, basically you effectively are shorting out the two pins of the motor, the plus and minus pin of the motor um, to each other, thereby collapsing the magnetic field and stopping it immediately. So the, 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 the output, the, uh, the, <clears throat> those four outputs when used in full bridge mode, uh, let you do that. It, may, it lets you go high Z, which everything's open, let you go forward, let you go reverse, and let you go into brake mode, okay? So you can do precision motor control with this, with this DIO box. So for the motor manufacturers, you could use this to test motors. Um, you could do quite a bit of, of stuff with this, um, do motion control um, and whatnot. So any questions on the DIO? It's uh, super, uh, very, very complex, I would say complicated model, but like I said, I've never seen one quite like this that does this, so um, my favorite module. Um, and then we've just got basically a relay module called the power relay. Um, now that's eight um, five amp relays. So um, for anybody interested, silver, nickel, uh, it's a silver, nickel contacts, uh, the high uh, quality telecom, 2.5 million operations. So um, you will probably not wear out these um, for a while. If you're doing life test, so you're making a button presser or something like that, that press buttons. Um, maybe you've got um, you know air cylinders hooked up to uh, uh, press buttons on a radio or something like that. And you want to flip the, the air cylinders on and off, or the air valves on and off. You would use could use this to do that. Um, there's just a number of things you can do with this with this power relay that are automotive related. <clears throat> Oops. And last but not least here, the CanHub converts the native UART language uh, communication protocol of, uh, of the RAD IO2 to CAN. So now it's speaking CAN to any other device. So with the CanHub, you can make your own cable. There's really only about five pins to solder to, or resell a cable just for your convenience. Um, it has a DB9 on each side, so it can hook up to a, a value can or any other can tool that utilizes the DB9, which has kind of become like a de facto connection. So the physical properties, this is my favorite slide here. 
the heavy, it's a, it's a heavy duty die cast case. So, so I'm taking data right now and I just drove over it with my F-150 and it still works no problem. So they're really, really rugged. So, and um, all of the, again, all the modules have a connector, uh, basically use those Phoenix connectors, except the thermocouple module actually uses a standard thermocouple type of <clears throat> pin. Um, on average, the units draw between 200 to 450 milliamps. So it really depends on the mix of them, how many that you can connect up. Uh, as you can see, I have uh, down below the, the demo, I'm connected, I have three of them. You can usually typically get four modules connected together without having any problem with power. Um, in fact, I got the current draw specs uh, right here for the TC and everything. And uh, the analog out. The Fire 2, incidentally, is, is limited to 500 milliamps. So uh, it can only use power two units at a time and the same with the ion, a little bit more with the ion. Now, how do you set these guys up? Well, you can either write your own code, which some people have done, or we give you a free JavaScript program <clears throat> uh, that you download and you can set up, um, First thing you do is go online and you can start measuring and looking at, you know, the number, you know, at, at, uh, whatever measurements you're doing. Um, and I get a little bit more into this. Uh, now, is this going to be available, these PowerPoints for, for download? Or, uh, you don't know? Okay. Anybody, if anybody wants us a PowerPoint, please ask him. I'll get you, uh, I can get you a PDF version. We don't, we, by uh, company policy, we do not give out. Power, PowerPoint versions. <clears throat> so you can see here, in the interest of not getting too far into it here, um, you can change all the attributes here. Um, you can change your CAN um, settings and what CAN ID that you want. You can use CAN FD if you want. <clears throat> so you could actually put um, on a lot of the modules, you could put the, uh, all the different uh, messages into one CAN FD message. For all the different measurements, because KMFT, of course, is 60, 64 bytes um, of data. And um, we use uh, typically, like for the thermocouple and the analog in, we use uh, IEEE 32 flow. So that's four bytes, right? So four, four times uh, eight obviously is 32. So yeah, every, the whole thing will fit in one KMFT message, which is kind of cool. We also give you a calibration <clears throat> screen to do the calibration of the thermocouple and analog inputs and analog outputs. So they come from the factory calibrated. We have a, a calibration system from uh, Fluke, um, which was definitely over 10, 12, 15 grand or so. And it's an automated cal system. You just put the unit in, they connect it up, and they hit go, and it calibrates the unit, flashes the coefficients to it. So again, there's three ways to communicate with the Red IO2. Um, <clears throat> connect the units to the PC, do and, and write your own, and write your own code. Connect them to the actual uh, again to a to a, a Fire Two, a Red Two, or what have you, or connect it to the CAN hub. Again, direct to the PC would look like this. Um, you could actually connect uh, more than one unit <clears throat> to a PC if you wanted to, to get higher throughput. And we have on our GitHub site, um, we see we're giving or selling a Rad IO2 badge. And uh, we have sample code to do that. There's also sample code to, to uh, use the Rad IO2 independently. More typically than not, would probably most people be using it either with the fire with the ion fire two three the red two or value can industrial, and if that if you do that the data goes to what's called the neovi channel, um, which is like a can channel, and the third way again of course is through the can hub you can uh, connect uh, up to four units typically, and um, this will convert all the info to can. Um, and it'll just, it'll just basically pipe it out, 
send it out the CAN channel. If it's a, if you if you're doing uh, something like an an, uh, an analog output, you're going to be pushing CAN back in, CAN messages in to get something converted. So this is like the sample decoding info here. You basically just create a message, or you don't have to create a message. There's um, as I show up here. You know, I won't get it. I think I lost that. But anyway, there's you can save after you if you do the configuration with the JavaScript program, you can save it as a DBC file. So you don't have to generate all these message editors here. I guess I wanted to show you what it, you know, it looks just like you would any can message. But again, the DBC file will do it all for you. And this particular one is 32 bit little Indian. And um, that's it. And, um, and I talked about isolation already. This one kind of gets a little bit more into it. Um, and I say beware, a lot of companies will claim isolation. There's, there's a couple of them that I don't want to say their names, but they always say it's isolated. Then you find out it's, it's USB isolated. It's not channel to channel isolated. So be careful if you want isolation. And because um, uh, it, that, it's, that it's actual channel to channel isolation, not just USB isolation. Because almost everything, USB handles the isolation just by the chipset. Everything, almost anything that's USB is isolated. Again, we are we are bank <clears throat> we are bank to bank isolated, and uh, for most devices that's typically good enough, uh, which is in effect channel to channel for most of our devices. So I get a little bit into um, you know the differential and common mode. I think I talked about that a little bit. That if you even though you have a plus and a minus when you're measuring like an analog input. If that minus, if that you're measuring, if this is ground, right, and you're trying to measure something like, so you're trying to measure three volts, but the not the minus terminal sitting at 30 volts, you will smoke your system on a normal A to D system, not on this. So that's what isolation is all about. You're really truly isolated, just as if you had a fluke meter with rubber gloves on, you know. And here's a little tech note on it that kind of dives into this, um, you know, in better description here. And um, one of the things that's really useful for doing the isolate, why isolation is so useful, if you want to measure the current going into an automotive component, um, a lot of times there's a lot of paths to ground, okay, and only one battery line, okay. So if you want to measure how much current a module is consuming, um, you would want to probably use a shunt. And if you use a shunt, you're going to be above 12 volts, right? So a lot of car batteries, 13.8, whatever, 14.2 volts. You have a shunt that's feeding the VBAT. You're measuring your plus side of your analog end goes to the, goes to the VBAT, and minus side goes across that shunt. That shunt might be like a 0.010 resistor, 0010, whatever, depending on um, accuracy of what you're looking for. And again, if you just buy a cheapo card, you'll smoke it if you have more than one hooked up to something else. So high side shunt is a, a big important way of measuring current. And I kind of delve a lot more into, uh, into this. Uh, this is kind of the way, like when I used to build industrial equipment, how we would maintain uh, to get isolation. We buy these 5B modules, and uh, these things are about 200 bucks each. And all it did was isolate. It did not actually do the A to D. So you can tell me the time is almost up, right? Okay, there I'm up. Well, one thing I was gonna do real quick is just go over, um, in fact, again, how do you how do you configure the Red IO two? You uh, use the the free JavaScript program. Does the Red IO two work with vSpy? No, it works with vSpy as if it's a CAN channel, not just you can't just plug in the Red IO two to the USB port on your computer and vSpy and look at it. You have to have it either convert it to CAN and read it as CAN or read it through the uh, VCAN Industrial or a Fire two or whatnot. And then um, I'm going to skip past here in the interest of just uh, is there something else you need to know? No. No? 
Okay, I'm just trying to get back on track. Five minutes and everybody next. Yeah, then we have next class. So again, um, how do you uh, uh, 100 samples a second again? But this is what I want to talk about the demo. So if you see the demo, it's got the this graphic is on there. Um, I just want to explain this demo and then I'll be done. The VCAN Industrial is also a, a product of mine. And um, uh, it came about because of the, uh, the form factor and also the uh, isolation. So the VCAN Industrial is also galvanically isolated. <clears throat> so CAN1 is isolated from CAN2s. The LIN bus is isolated. Everything's isolated from each other. So it's kind of a big deal if you wanted to measure, uh, say you had two engine controllers or, or six engine controllers that you want to measure, right? And you're doing PVDV or durability testing, and you got these things thrown in a chamber or whatever. And a lot of times, instead of using one big power supply, uh, a lot of people use separate power supplies to power all these things up. Um, now, if you start using a standard Fire 2, you potentially, depending on how you have things wired, um, could get some problems because the, you would have to make sure that all the grounds eventually are, are tied to ground on those six power supplies. If you didn't want them tied to ground for other reasons, um, you got a little problem. You almost need to have a separate uh, CAN channel per device. And that's exactly what the, the VCAN Industrial, which is in the demo, does. It has uh, galvanic isolation between channels. Okay, so on the one side of the VCAN industrial, um, we're tied right to the RAD IO2. On the other side of the VCAN industrial, I'm going to the CAN hub. And the other CAN channel of the VCAN industrial goes to the VIVIT CAN. So I'm thinking that there might be some kind of class in there. And in summary, 765 bucks a module, uh, with the exception of the uh, relay module 659. CAN hub's 215. So again, we're below uh, 100 bucks a channel, and that's it.